is True North TV, powered by Communitech. From Waterloo Region, Ontario, Canada, to the world. The conversations you need and want to hear with interesting people on topics at the intersection of technology and humanity. Tech for good. Let's get started. Thank you, Talia. Hello and welcome to another episode of True North TV. I'm Ian Klugman and I'm your host. Well, here in Waterloo Region, we are home to a two-horned unicorn, a company that was recently valued at more than $2 million. And that company is called Applyboard, and since it launched five years ago, it has been on a rocket ride, to say the least. Applyboard's platform makes it easy for international students to apply to universities, colleges, and other educational institutions around the world. In true startup fashion, its founders, three brothers from Iran, who came to Canada to study, drew their entrepreneurial inspiration from their own personal experience as international students. Applyboard has since raised $242 million in investment, $170 million of that was in this year alone. And to talk about this amazing story, I'm joined today by Martin Basiri, CEO of Applyboard, and Nick Solero, partner at Ohio-based Drive Capital, one of Applyboard's biggest investors. Martin and Nick, welcome to True North TV. Thank you for having me. Now, Martin, to kick it off, uh, Tell me about the journey. Tell me a bit about uh, how you got started and, and how you ended up running this, uh, launching Applyboard. I came to Canada exactly 10 years ago uh, to study for my master's degree. And I remember when one of my family members came to pick me up from Pearson Airport and we were going to their place. On the road there, I, I fell in love with Canada. And this is like, think about it. We haven't seen the university, nothing. I said, I love it here. I need to bring my brothers here. And, you know, this, this would be permanent. Then um, I started working on my dad and finally, like, he, he agreed to it. Now we had to figure it out how to bring a 17-year-old, uh, like two 17-year-olds with uh, my parents, that especially they didn't have much money. And uh, finally, we figured out a way. Then we helped other people to also come. You know, I was an engineer, so I was working as an engineer in Ohio. And my brother is like, finishing a school here in Waterloo. And then, you know, it was time to get back to entrepreneurship because back in Iran, I, I had a lot of projects and things and I missed that, you know, the problem solving part of the, the thing and the uncertainty of it. Then uh, I called my brothers and said, hey, are you guys ready? He said, they're ready. So we all like get together and we start hiring and the rest is history. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, we started from this building actually. Yes, Velocity. absolutely. Yep. So uh, what's the one thing that surprised you about, uh, about the journey so far? Because it's been, what, five years now? Uh, yeah, five and a half years. Yeah. What's the one thing that's uh, surprised you about it? So from the beginning, I knew it's going to be very big from the numbers perspective, from the engineering perspective. The, 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 the piece that I couldn't imagine it was the people behind it and how much of this become this mission of making education accessible for students around the world become, uh, become the center of attracting all people together and the joy and happiness of not only us, also our employees and also our investors and also our customers. And what I love the most is like thousands of people gather together, including our customers and everyone have one goal uh, and it's our mission to make education accessible. You know, to me, success is when child of a billionaire in Palo Alto and child of a poorest person in a country like Bangladesh, Iran, India, they could have access to the same education. And what is very surprising for me is like how much so many people love this and they're behind this and they're supporting their, their part of it. And things go forward because of that alignment between apply for founders, employees, investors, and customers, and the community. Well, you know, having a purpose uh, for an organization is a, is a very powerful thing. We run a purposeful uh, organization here at Community Tech as well, and um, because it attracts people to, to want to be part of that journey. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Nick now. Um, Nick, uh, you uh, first encountered Martin and the, and the three brothers. Uh, you decided to invest in them. What were you thinking? So. At Drive, we really invest in companies that have two key characteristics. Um, you know, the first is they go after very, very large markets, right? So in our view, we want to invest in companies that have the opportunity 
to not be medium-sized outcomes, but to be you know, massive poster on the wall sorts of companies. Uh, and the second is, is we want to invest in the category winning company. If you go through our website, you're going to see a lot of different logos. Some will be earlier stage, later stage, but the two common threads through everything is that we at Drive believe that they're going after massive markets and they're, they're destined to be the number one player. Uh, and so when I came across a, a ply board, I immediately was like, oh my gosh, they're going after a huge market, it's half a trillion dollars or more in North America, two trillion, if you think about it globally. Uh, and their angle on connecting talent on a global basis is something that you just don't see. And so, you know, you ask, what was it like when they came to visit me? Martin didn't come to visit me. I actually showed up uninvited in Kitchener and just knocked on the door. Uh, and he didn't take the meeting. Uh, it was Josh, their director of finance, who was like, all right, fine, I'll give you a few minutes. And it wasn't until the very end of that meeting that Martin popped his head in and I got to, you know, actually meet Martin, the person, as opposed to Martin, the face on the website. So when I got to see, you know, the, the I think the special nature of Martin and his brothers matched with those characteristics of a massive market and a truly unique insight, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, the closest thing to love at first sight for a venture investor. And it, you know, it took me, gosh, over another 18 months or so to, to finally earn the opportunity to invest. But, uh, you know, here we are. Glad, glad we were able to make it happen. That, that, that's, that's a great story. Martin, what do you remember from that situation? <laughs> like, I didn't want to be rude or something. Like, we finished the fundraising. I was focused in a couple of, like, big problems. And, you know, like, as a, like, as a CEO, like, I have to always, like, be open. But at the same time, Ian, like, I received per week five to ten emails from like big big firms so never i wanted to be like by any chance of like saying but one thing that really derived for us is like derived capital did two things one is that one when i said yeah i can't do it and then they still like did it so they didn't they didn't say no and then i was like then josh was like texting me during the meeting so it was like wow if they really do it, they really want to be partner. I also want to be partner with people who really want to be our partner. And the other thing, like during the pandemic, uh, something very interesting happened. We started the fundraising in February time and we had multiple offers. And end of February, uh, early March, we signed the term sheet with Drive Capital as a lead. And... Uh, we had a couple of investors that actually other investors that when the pandemic started, they kind of like backed up. I remember we were worried that same thing happened with Drive Capital. And remember, this is early March when the market is just coming down and people talking about long term decision and everything. Nick called me. Think about it. Nick called me and my heart was like, OK, now he's calling. It's better to wait. Things are thing. You know what he said? He said, oh, we are not type of people that back up when things go wrong. We said we are in, we are in. And that time I was like, that, that is a type of partner. When, when the whole world going and it was uncertain and th things are just going bad, uh, these guys stand strong behind what they believe and be behind the people who believe. And um, that, that's amazing. Like Till March 20, the market was just going down. We closed basically March 27, just seven days after that. And kudos to them that they're thinking long term, and uh, we are very happy with our partnership. Going back to, to Nick um, uh, for a second, I mean, I know you know being a VC and having portfolio companies is a bit like a parent, but where does the ply board rank as far as your favorite? Oh, you're going to put me on the spot here. <laughs> Obviously, Martin and a ply board are very near and dear, but I have to give the appropriate answer. We love all of our children equally. Um, but, you know, it, 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 I guess to, to put it in a different way, more seriously, if I think about the magnitude of the opportunity, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find um, something that if you just dare to dream for a minute, you say, well, what if it works? What if it works? What if we at Apply Board are the way that every, you know, that we have a global access to education, like, does it matter? Is at the end of the day, is, is all of the work worthwhile? And I, you know, I think on that basis, apply board is right near the top. So Nick, um, uh, uh, we're big fans of uh, Steve Case and, 
and the work that he's doing around rise of the rest. Uh, why Ohio? Uh, I mean, and, and investing in a company in Waterloo as opposed to, you know, the Valley. It's actually a big part of our story at Drive. It's worth pointing out we're not from Ohio. I don't think anyone's actually from Ohio. Is that true? <laughs> Anyone in Ohio from Ohio? Uh, well, so, put it this way: none of the principles at Drive are from Ohio. We actually came here from Silicon Valley. Uh, depending on who you're talking to, we were either founders, operators, investors, all of us in the Valley, all of us there, because historically that's been the best place in the world to be in the technology business, right? So if you were serious about building a company or building a career in technology, step one, move to the Valley. And that's what we did. I'm from Seattle, you know, Chris is, you know, none of us are from the Valley, the Valley either, frankly. Right? We all went there because that was what we felt was the best thing for our, our careers and, and the opportunity. Um, and the reason why that model persisted is because Silicon Valley enjoyed for the better part of five decades what amounted to a talent monopoly specifically around engineering talent. And so if you were an entrepreneur like Martin and you had globally significant ambitions like Martin for a long, long time, his ability to be successful was a function of his, of his ability to hire not one or two, but 10 or 100 or 1,000 engineers. And there just was a small handful of places on earth where you could credibly say you're going to do that. And the valley was, was right at the top. Um, but that's just not so anymore, right? The secret is out. There are really smart people in a lot more places than the 46 miles between San Francisco and San Jose. And we felt that implicitly in the companies that we were investing in, or the companies that we were working with there, as they were opening up offices in Denver and in Austin and elsewhere, and that, that stranglehold on engineering talent uh, was melting away. And so we asked a very simple question, which is, well, what's the new unfair advantage, right? Where could entrepreneurs naturally sniff out those unfair advantages and use them to build the best companies in the world? And our founding thesis is that customers are the new unfair advantage. And that same entrepreneur with those same ambitions, if he or she no longer needs to optimize for engineering talent, they will instead optimize for customer density. And if you look at the map on that basis, it looks fundamentally different. And you know, if you think if you were to plot GDP uh, on the map, like as a heat map, or if you were to plot population density, or if you were to plot city proximities, you know, kind of loosely defined Columbus, Ohio is right smack in the middle of the economic center of mass of North America. Those are where customers live. This area, this spot on the map should yield more market defining multi-billion dollar businesses than ever before. And that the only thing that was missing now was capital. And so we figured, heck, we'll bring the capital here and we'll start investing in the best people building with the biggest ideas in places like Columbus or Waterloo or Toronto or Pittsburgh and so on. And that's what we've been up to. That's very, very cool. I, I got a question really for both of you. Um, you know, in many respects, um, uh, the notion of, of proximity uh, has become optional. And I think I had a, a conversation with John Seeley Brown recently, and, and he said this is going to impact, you know, firm formation. Um, how do you think it's impacting you and your ability to hire talent? Yeah, like um, before, even before pandemic, like we had employees in 20 countries. So from it, for, for us, it was already built into our culture and already built into our company. And we were working in different time zones, different languages. As you know, like our company is extremely diverse, like with 60% uh, minority, 40% immigrant, 65% speak another language. So... It wasn't really affecting in a bad way or in a good way. Uh, of course, for us as a human, when we go all remote for, for our headquarter, it was a, it, we are still in that learning curve of learning how much meeting you should have, when you should have that meeting, how much communication, what's the most effective communication. It, I didn't see it for our company a, a major impact. And Nick, uh, what are you seeing as far as the impact of COVID on uh, on venture capital in your industry? Like anyone did, uh, certainly in the early days, is it, it is it forced everyone to check your assumptions, right? And I, and I think you check your assumptions around work from office versus work from home, 
can you be successful with virtual teams? You know, heck, for us, it doesn't make sense to deploy capital into this uncertainty. Um, but, but by and large, at least at Drive, we've remained open for business. As, as Martin mentioned earlier, you know, we, we, we made a substantial investment into a fly board uh, just days into the pandemic when I'd say uncertainty was, you know, at or, you know, reaching a crescendo. Um, and then as it results to the way the companies approach talents and virtual workforces and work from home, you know, in, in my view is that the jury is, is very much still out. I think what we've learned is that certain, you know, maybe the old model of working Monday through Friday and you're in the office and weekends you're at home and you're either working and, you know, those sorts of things maybe um, are becoming a little bit less rigid. But I personally believe that there is no still no substitute for in-person meetings, um, in, in, in particular among teams, and in particular when you need you're, you're forming real relationships and real partnerships. So you know, if you're going to ask your customer to sign a seven-figure check, or you're going to ask your team to solve a really really hard problem, I think those sorts of things still. You know, need, you know, maybe don't need to be done in person, but they, you know, if you can, th th those are great in-person opportunities. And, and so I, I think work from home or a permanent work from home footing um, is likely not going to be the net result of this. Yeah, and I'm, I'm with you on that absolutely 100%. Um, uh, it was interesting at first when the, when the pandemic hit, of course, uh, the CEOs were all running around going, this is great, productivity is through the roof. Uh, we can dump all our real estate. Uh, and then, of course, they discovered that people were lonely and suffering from mental illness and a huge, huge levels of anxiety. Uh, and I think that there's been a, a sort of a day of reckoning and people have come back around to the fa fact that at the end of the day, we are human beings and we need other human beings in our lives, even if we've got a piece of plexiglass between us. Yeah. It's, so, it's so good to see you. Um, I got a question for you, you know, with or without the pandemic, and I think it's going to have an impact on education uh, as we look forward, but but what do we see? Uh, do we see big shifts happening in post-secondary education, um, both in Canada and around the world over the next little while? Um, it depends on what timeline we're talking about. Like education industry, especially like a higher education in terms of like use of technology, they're like behind, for example, e-commerce. Mm. So I would sometimes like I say higher education is like we are in year 1999. And uh, where e-commerce was in 1999. Um, yes, like huge acceleration happened. Um, focus on, um, there is a huge focus on experience of the students. And actually that's what a lot of people go to college for, not only for the knowledge that you get, but for the experience and the club and the uh, inclusiveness of that. So a lot of good things happening for us. Um, in the short term, we had the impact because what? We got border closed. The students now forced to go online. A lot of the school, they were not ready. September, they were ready. So a lot of the students, like we are hearing very good news that the schools, they're, they're like way more ready. The students are started online. And soon, uh, like in 16 days, basically, they, they are allowed to start like coming again. Uh, one thing that was very interesting for us, since, for example, universities couldn't travel for their international recruitment, very fast, they, they basically, uh, we started like signing up new schools and they came to us and said, hey, we have these things. And we were like, we're ready to go. And we scaled this very fast. We started the pandemic with around like 400 people and now we are 600 people. Oh. So, and onboarding new people over, the, over Zoom was another experience that I'm so happy that I experienced it in my life. I, I'm, I'm with you, I love in-person things. But at the same time, you know, I, I adopted whatever, like the things that I don't have control on it, like we go with the flow. And it was also very experiential for me. Like, I, how do I make a, like a deep relationship that I have with people over Zoom when they're new? So I start like picking like uh, jokes that I, I throw at them or like I pick up something and say, oh yeah, what's the fly behind you? And they're like, so what? And then like we, we break the ice right away even on the uh, Zoom, so we try our best. I think personally it made me a very, very better human being. And as we go back together, like when in person come, I think I take the personal touch way more um, serious. 
and I try to spend more on uh, um, personal human touch with people and connect to another level, I can't wait that to happen. And that's a sign of a good entrepreneur is being flexible and finding ways of working with whatever the situation. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting because I remember the first time I met you, uh, it was very early on. It was in this building. And uh, people were saying, you know, that th th what they're doing is not going to work. And, and th those, those brothers are crazy. And I said, you know what? They're crazy, but they've got such passion. They're going to figure this out. They're, they're going to make this work. Um, and it's so exciting to see the journey that you've been on and, and uh, to be in you know, front row, row suites to the rest of the journey. So, uh, Martin, tell me a bit about why you know, access and accessibility of education is important to you personally. Yes. So I came from lower middle class family. And I'm so happy that we, like, like I could get education. My parents did everything. They sold their homes, everything for our education. Like, there, is, there is not even a more powerful tool than to help people to change not only their life, their, their family life, and their future of their generation life, like their lives. I lived in Sierra Leone, in second poorest country in the world. Um, and like when I was there, the whole thing was like, this is, it needs a lot of time for things to change here. And the only thing that was coming to my mind was like, this guy needs fresh water, they need good food, because if you don't have it, you cannot function as a human being. And they need education so they can rebuild it. And it's so important. I, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And I'm so hopeful that when I'm 70 years old, 75 years old, whatever, like 40 years from now, I can see that child of a billionaire and child of the poorest person in the world, they could have access to the same education. Because then what our destiny is, is not the situation or religion or location that we were born. Now it's like how much work we put into it to change our destiny. Well, listen, I wanted to take an opportunity to thank you for joining us here today, Martin. Um, it's, uh, it's always um, uh, a big energy boost when I get time with you because you've got so much enthusiasm about what you do and the company. So thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. And Nick, thank you so much for dialing in from Ohio. And uh, next time you're in town, when you can travel, we'd love to actually meet firsthand in person and perhaps share a beer. Absolutely. Thanks for having me in. And uh, like I told Martin earlier, I... I'm long overdue for buying him a steak dinner because uh, we haven't been able to meet in person uh, since COVID is happening. And I would love to offer you the same, same thing. Fantastic. We look forward to that. So listen, I also wanted to take an opportunity to thank all of you who've joined us here today for this session of True North TV. And we will see you next Tuesday at noon right here. Thank you. Missed an episode? Watch them on demand at truenorthwaterloo.com or subscribe to Communitech's YouTube channel.